Welcome to Think Big with Michael Zellner, powered by Platinum Jewelers. All positive, no politics. This is a positive only zone here. There's enough negativity out there to read about, hear, see. But on this podcast, you're only going to get good and positive messages from my guests. Joining me today on episode 105 is Kathleen McClellan. Kathleen is a television host. She's a model, actress, director, executive producer, and she's soon to be a podcast host too. She was Miss Illinois Teen USA and finished third runner up in the national teen Miss USA pageant. She hosted the number one show for better or for worse on TLC in the early 2000s. And most recently, she starred in the award winning drama, uh, excuse me, award winning film Rattlesnakes in 2019. She's also launching her lifestyle brand, Rich Life Simply Made. And I can't wait for her to share more about that today and with the audience too. Thanks for joining me today, Kathleen. Hi, Michael. Thanks so much for having me. It's my pleasure. Tell us something interesting about yourself that most people don't know. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> huh. um, you know, I don't, I'm trying to think, hold on, I'm going to have to pause. Something interesting about myself that people don't know. Um, I always start off with this question because it's one to get people to think a little bit. Dumped me, I Michael. I do this to make people um, think. Uh, let's see here. What do pe- I mean, there's probably people don't really know me, so there's probably so much. I um I don't know. I mean, give me give me like a topic. Give me like a well, something stuff. from you from some for your early life. Something from my early life. Okay. Um, I have a lot of experience working in cornfields. Cornfields, bean fields. I uh, walked beans. I detasseled corn. Um, so pretty much apart from being an actor, model, TV host, creative person, the only actual skills I have um, have to do with manual labor in fields. No, I know your dad had farmland and owned the seed company when you were a child. So, you know, you helped them out when you talk about the walking beans and tasseling corn. And that mm-hmm. actually was one of the questions I was going to ask you. So <laughs> that you brought that up. Tell the audience what detasseling corn and walking beans means. Okay. That's so funny because, you know, you just, when you have experience walking beans and detasseling corn, you just assume the world does, right. too, but you know, they don't. So let's see, um, walking beans, we'll start there. Um, when you're growing a field of beans, you don't want the weeds to take over. So, uh, you will pay small children often, uh, to walk down the rows of the beans with, it's like a hoe with like a hook on the end of it. And you come to a bean. I mean, you come to a weed, you step on it, you stick the little tool underneath it. You yank the root up off of the ground and then you keep walking. Interesting. That's that's walking beans. So walk, you're basically walking beans. You're pulling weeds. Detasseling corn, I was much less successful at. And truth be told, I, I don't think it lasted more than a good five days in the cornfield. Um, and I think I spent the amount of money I made detasseling corn on something called corn huskers lotion which repairs your hands after pulling the tassels. But basically you kind of ride through the fields on this elevated machine and physically hand pull um, the, the um, germinating fertilizing tassels so that, and I'm embarrassed to say, I don't even understand like the whole procreation uh, theory with all of it, but you're basically pulling the tassels off so that the corn keeps growing in the proper way that it needs to. Very interesting. <laughs> but that was a lot of fun as a kid to do that kind of stuff. It, you know what it was, it was, and it, it gave me a nice, um, you know, it just kind of connected me to nature and to the ground and to the land. And, um, you know, as much as it kind of wasn't cool, in my mind then, um, it's really cool now. And it makes me realize 
you know, how much nature is just a part of me, but also a, a part of everyone. And, you know, just when you think about like the sickness in the world, the sickness in our minds and our hearts and our connecting with each other, the more we can just tap into nature and the natural rhythms of things um, as they were meant to be, you right. know, back when we had to hunt and gather um, back when we were cavemen, back when you didn't just order from Postmates, when you, you know, had to go kill something or, um, you know, grow something and eat it and then wait and be hungry. Right. You know, it right. just, you, you realize that those natural rhythms of life and the circle of life are very healthy for us and kind of healing when we get, when we lose our way. Absolutely. You know, you grew up in the uh, Midwestern city of Bloomington, Illinois, and, you know, beside yourself, I guess Bloomington is probably best known for being the headquarters for State Farm Insurance. Um, You graduated from Central Catholic High School in 1988, Mm -hmm. you know, appropriately home of the Saints. What was it like for you? What was it like growing up there? Done your research, Michael. I'm so impressed. Yeah, wait. I'm sorry. I just have to back up and just say, like, as somebody who's about to be hosting a podcast, I'm really impressed with your research. So wait, you you just you distracted me with your with your extreme knowledge of of the saints. Um. So wait, what was the question? What was it like growing there uh, as a kid in the '80s? Oh gosh, I mean, just about the best thing there was, quite frankly. Um, you know, Central Catholic High School was, uh, was an amazing place. I had a, a great group of friends. Um, our whole life was about, you know, cheerleading and football and basketball and, um, you know, driving around in our, we, we, we had, when you were, when you were a 16 year old and, uh, in the eighties, you 1986 to be exact, you were kind of issued a large vintage boat like convertible when you got your license and it was almost like a parade i mean we would just do these circles from you know we'd go down country club drive we'd go to the dairy queen you'd drive by all the cute boys houses come back home and just you know it was just a circle that you and everybody else was doing and you know it was our social life it was a good time Dairy Queen has the best ice cream. <laughs> Blizzards, baby. Yeah, Blizzards and vanilla diet cokes. That's I've never had one that. of those. <laughs> you know, your modeling career, you know, started in in your hometown newspaper, the Pantograph. Uh, you know, the same year that you graduated from high school in 1988, you're crowned Miss Illinois Teen USA. You were also named uh, most photogenic in the National Miss Teen USA pageant too. Uh, I believe the infamous Dick Clark hosted that pageant. Yeah. Um, I, I know how competitive that probably was for everyone. You know, everyone wants to win, you know, but were you able to enjoy yourself and have fun doing that? Um, the pageant, I mean, it was a blast. Um, you know, I'll tell you, uh, it wasn't even something that I was really pursuing or looking into. And, um, one of the things that I would do to get out of class and get out of study hall is I became the assistant to the school counselor, Mrs. Moore. And Mrs. Moore's daughters were very theatrical. Um, and I think I was even taking like some some speech lessons from them or singing. I don't, I don't even remember. But it was Mrs. Moore who I think even possibly filled out the paperwork and signed me up for this pageant, which um, was not really something I was even thinking about doing. And when it kind of came time to go to Chicago for the weekend, you know, I said, can we just go shopping? You know, why are we, why are we doing this? And my mother said, you know what, this is an honor that somebody thought of you for this and you've been accepted and you know, this is the plan and I think you should just follow through and go do it. So, um, you know, it was one weekend that honestly changed the trajectory of my life that I wasn't even necessarily anticipating. I was going to study journalism and, um, you know, I, I had this desire to kind of cover world events and, you know, go into war torn regions. And I had this feeling like you could go anywhere. And if you were covering the news and telling the truth that you were somehow protected. So, um, 
you know, that was my, that was my path. And then I, you know, ended up at this pageant one weekend. I, I won it. Um, and then, you know, found myself at the national pageant and, um, you know, when they, I was third, third place and most photogenic. And then, um, from that elite found me an elite modeling agency. And they said, you know, we're going to, we're going to take you, we're going to send you to Europe and we're going to make you a book and blah, blah, blah. And I mean, it was just such a foreign concept to anything that I had ever experienced and such a great opportunity. You know, you just, you can't say no. So, you know, off I went. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, but it was, it was, it was fantastic. It was a great experience. I believe elites, uh, was a John Casablancas, right? John Casablancas. Yep. And they sent you to Paris, you know, that must've been a pretty exciting time for you at such a young age. It, you know, it was, it was a blast. I've always been, always been a hard worker. Um, so, you know, my focus was always on getting up early, eating healthy, being clean, you know, doing what you needed to do to, to do your best, you know, at work. And, um, so it really kind of kept me on this straight and narrow because I think there's you know, a lot of people can run off into modeling and kind of get off track. But for me, um, I mean, that first year, I, I literally, I left home after graduating. I had a suitcase, no knowledge of how to do laundry and, um, and an address of an agency in Madrid. That was my first stop. And the address wasn't even correct. And, you know, you know, you get there, they put you in a model's apartment with other girls and, you know, they give you like this crazy map of a foreign city in a different language and you find your way. And um, I learned so much in that first year, year and a half of life, um, just being independent and living like that. You know, I think you you and I have talked, I believe, you know, off camera before, I'm a big believer that there are no coincidences and, you know, with your, you know, counselor signing you up the way that happened and, you know, cause you never were going to go that way and you end up winning Miss Illinois Teen USA and going to the national pageant and then end up getting signed by elite going to Europe. It happened the exact way it was supposed to happen. You know what? You know, life is, life is amazing and it can take you in so many different places. And, you know, it's like sliding doors you, you can go down a path. And as long as, in my opinion, as long as you keep moving forward, even when you take a wrong path, at least you're moving forward, you're learning life lessons and you're like, okay, you know, here's this path. Oh, I've learned this about myself. I've learned this about what I can give to the world, but maybe that's a dead end pivot. You know, like every, as long as you're moving forward, every step is a step. Right. You know, 1990, uh, season two, episode four of Grand, the return of Yale Penthouse. <laughs> I believe that was your first television acting job. What led you, you know, your decision to go into acting? And, and how did this role of playing Misty in the show come about for you? It's so funny, Michael. Oh, my God. I haven't thought of um, that show in so long. Um Wait, so wait, what, what was the question? What what led you decide to go? What what made you decide to go into acting? You know, okay, okay. From modeling to acting, and then you know, how'd the role come about for you? Okay, so um, how did I decide to go into acting? Without realizing that I was an actor, I've always been an actor. Um, I grew up writing, performing plays in my backyard, you know, doing the hair, the makeup, the costumery, sending out the invitations. And I honestly thought that's what everybody else was doing in their backyard. And my mother later told me, no, that was, that was just you. And uh, so, you know, but I wasn't a theater kid, you know, we didn't really have, it was a small town. We didn't really have that. I don't even think I did the plays in school. Um, I just loved the art of storytelling, um, loved it. Like just, it was what I did when we and I had a babysitter, you know, I'd be like, Hey, let's write an original song and perform it for my parents when they get home. Like that was just what I thought everybody did. Right. Um, and, uh, 
Oh, sorry, my ring doorbell's going off. <laughs> um, so let's see. So I was just kind of taking things as they came along and, you know, I was modeling and my mother honestly wasn't super excited about all that. And, um, I, she encouraged me to go to college. And I think in the course of about like a long weekend when I was home visiting, you know, she's like, how about we just pop on into college next week and see, see what happens. So I found myself at the university of South Carolina and um, very quickly realized that I did not belong there. And, um, but made a really good friend because a, a good friend of mine who ironically was Miss South Carolina teen when I was Miss Illinois teen was there too. So nice. we had a blast. We made the best of it. But, you know, there I was, uh, you know, taking my classes, getting straight A's. Um, but my agency in Paris was still calling me and they're like, what are you, what are you doing? Where are you? <laughs> Right. Like, what is going on? So they were still getting me jobs. So, you know, I'd go to class and I, you know, be like, hey, you know, um, I'm not going to be here for the next week because I've got this job and I'm going to be there doing this or doing that. And, you know, this was a different time and they were okay with it. They thought it was cool. They're like, okay, get your work done, blah, blah, blah. So I was still kind of, you know, getting things done. And I ended up at an audition somebody had tracked me down and they said we want you to go and meet with these two producers jerry Bruckheimer and don simpson um they're shooting a tom cruise movie i said okay great so um i think i told my mother you know i, I can't talk right now i've got an audition for a tom cruise movie and she was like what are you talking you know what are you you know because she kept thinking stop with all this hair brain modeling stuff and, you know, get back to class. And uh, I think my, 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 like a muffler problem, my car broke down, something, I don't know. But anyway, I end up at this audition. I walk in the door, Jerry Brookheimer, Don Simpson are sitting there and, and I, you know, I throw my book down and they're like, you know, European cover, European cover, Europe. They're like, what are you doing here? <laughs> And I said, you know, I, I don't even necessarily know, but here I am. And nobody even believes that you guys are here or that I'm here. And I just had car trouble and whatever. Nice to meet you. And, uh, you know, we proceeded to have like a fantastic conversation for about 15 minutes, just about acting and life and everything. And they were like, you know, we love you. You're hired. Um, so I spent about I think three weeks working on that movie Days of Thunder um you know part of it was there in South Carolina and then I was even in in Daytona and just you know um spent a lot of time spent a lot of time with uh with um you know Tony Scott who was one of the greatest directors of all times and um you know his uh his girlfriend at the time who became his wife, Donna Wilson, Robert Duvall. And um, they were like, you know, this is what you need to do. You need to, you need to go to LA and you need to go to the Howard Fine Acting Studio and you need to study for about three months. And if in that summer, you don't find yourself on a series. You know, it's just going to happen. Just go and try that. And if it doesn't happen, then go back to school. Right. You know, but they're like, tell your mom you're going to Pepperdine. Tell your mom, you know, as soon as you're, you know, making less money than your parents, you'll go back to school. Just, just get out there and give it a shot. So, um, so I did the year that that, uh, school year ended, I, you know, got in the car and my mother drove with me out to California, signed up for the Howard Fine Acting Studio, which was one of the greatest things I ever did for myself. And um, yeah, and then within, I'd say three months, I had, I had a series. But, um, but yeah, I think my first acting gig was playing Misty on Grand. 
you know, and a lot of people might not know, you know, the late Tony Scott, he directed so many hit movies, Top Gun, Beverly Hills Cop 2, Last Boy Scout, Crimson Tide, yeah. um, you know, and there's a funny story. Tony Scott and Robert Duvall, they made a bet with you. Tell us about that. They made a bet with me. Um, I mean, they basically just, they bet me, they bet me that if I came out to LA that, uh, I don't, you know, I don't remember the <laughs> It was something, it was about that, that you were going to be able to get on a, on a show and everything, but they, they bet you that you would be able to get oh, on. Yeah. A show. Yeah. yeah. They were like, we, 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 you're, you're going to make it. You're going to get out there. You're going to get a series. You're going to do it within three months. Was that right. what it was? Yeah, that what, that's it, what was? it was? Yeah. yeah okay. That yeah. Was that's what we just, yeah. That, yeah. I thought it was something else. Yeah. No, they're like, that was the bet. Yeah. We bet you, if you go out there. And you're there for three months that you'll have a series period right. of discussion. Yeah. That, that must've been fun time. Here you are never been in acting before. And you meet all these Cherry Bruckheimer, Tony Scott, Robert <laughs> Duvall, you're in a movie with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. I mean, that's so cool. You're about 20 years old. Yeah. You know, it's amazing how it always amazes me how, when you take someone out of a situation and you put them in any situation, how your perspective can change. Because if you are open to things that come your way and opportunities that come your way, basically anything is possible. Right. Because when I found myself there in that situation, I didn't think, oh my God, look where I am. I just was present. And because I was present and because I was listening to these people who really knew something, um, and I was open to their ideas and willing to give it a shot. It, it, that too changed the trajectory of my life. Um, and took me to a new place with great new experiences. Um, you know, I'll tell you the regrets, like one of the things that I notice about, um, and I don't know if it's because of my investor and upbringing or what, but, there was kind of this feeling that, you know, you don't want any handouts. You want to earn everything yourself. You want to do everything yourself. You want to prove that you can do it. And I don't know if that was so much just a me thing or a Midwestern thing, but, um, but when I was at that pageant, it's funny because I never talk about the pageant. I actually forget that I was ever even in a pageant. But when I was in that pageant, Dick Clark was very, very, very encouraging to me um, to the degree where I think I even sent him a letter. I sent him a thank you letter, um, you know, just for the advice and, you know, for everything during the pageant. And he wrote me back. Wow. Wrote me back in Bloomington, Illinois, and said, you know what? If you ever come out to L.A., I want you to look me up. And, you know, here's my business address. Here's the phone number. And I want you to let me know when you're here because I, I I, believe in you. And I think that you'll go far. And I would love to be a part of that. And, um, you know, I tell my kids constantly, if somebody wants to help you, let them. Because good people like to help good people. Absolutely. Good people that are older and established and feel like they've, you know, it's taken them years to get that knowledge. It feels so good to turn around and help somebody who's younger, who's where you were then, and to kind of hold their hand, encourage them and watch them progress. There, Nothing feels better than that. And it was a mistake that I came out to LA and I had this idea instead then I was like you know what I'm gonna make it and I'll show Dick I'll show Dick that I could do it and I didn't need that help and um that was a mistake and you know I think learning from your mistakes is part of life and so that's something that I I tell that story to my kids and their friends as often as I can um you know like you look at Ryan Seacrest and, you know, he's so amazing, so talented. I love him. But I look at that and I think, you know, 
Dick liked me too. Right. And um, so I learned a lesson from that. And I, I tried to um, try to see the fruit on the trees now and, um, you know, take those opportunities. And we grow from those lessons. Oh yeah. Yeah, we really do. I mean, so many times things just happen. You know, you find yourself in a room with certain people and an idea is being thrown around and it's so easy to to say, oh yeah, let's let's have lunch and talk about that later. Right. But in those magical times when I have the courage to follow up, when I um you know, break free from a pattern when I do something that's outside of my comfort zone and, you know, make something like that happen. Um, it never results in anything less than magic. Right. Absolutely. For sure. For sure. Are you shopping for a new watch, an engagement ring, any kind of jewelry at all? What's up, Memphis? This is Jaron Jackson Jr. from the Grizzlies, encouraging you all to shop where I shop, Platinum Jewelers here in Memphis. Platinum Jewelers has a big selection of earrings, stockable rings, luxury watches, necklaces, bracelets, really whenever you need. 9387 Poplar next to Fresh Market in Germantown. So if you need anything jewelry related, go to my spot, Platinum Jewelers. You, You said, quote, I believe that gut instinct and passion make up the roadmap to a life that is rich in experience, deep in relationship, and simple in its theoretical clutter, unquote. What does that mean to you? Repeat the quote. Repeat, repeat, repeat. I believe that gut instinct and passion make up the roadmap to a life that is rich in experience, deep in relationship, and simple in its theoretical clutter. Yeah. Gut instinct, you know, um, you know, when your gut just tells you something and you don't even know why you believe that, why you think that that thing is true. Um, when I actually pay attention to my gut instinct, even when it's uncomfortable, it never leads me astray. Um, I've had periods of my life where I completely went on gut instinct and I I would say it was like a magic carpet and it led me to magical places. And then I've had periods in my life where I didn't want to accept reality and um, fought, fought my gut instinct to the point where I silenced it um, and kind of treaded water, didn't really grow for a very long period of time which then again is a lesson in itself. Um, But yeah, I mean, when I follow my gut instinct, when I'm not led by fear, when I follow my passion, um, it always leads to magical places and success. Um, In life, everyone's motivated by different things. And, you know, my motivation is, is storytelling and um and just you know like this this creative feeling like i need to learn things experience them and then kind of regurgitate them um and when i do anything um out of passion out of a love for it it always um it always pays off um i mean so many so many examples there i just wouldn't even know where to begin now you also had a a recurring role on the soap opera the bold and the beautiful in 1994 you know it's back when soaps were super popular too what was it like being on that show are there any differences the way you prepare act on the soap opera compared to other roles um, so poppers are, are fun and funny, um, because, you know, there's, there's definitely a formula to it. Um, you know, it's all very kind of dramatic and melodramatic and, you know, it's also kind of like showing up and punching a clock. Yeah. Um, I love the people that I worked with. Uh, I worked with a really great model actress, Monica Schneer, who I just, I adore and, and still look up to. She's a Canadian um, actress. She's just a fantastic person. Um, 
You know, when I think about my time on The Bold and the Beautiful, one of the things that I really walked away from as a great experience from that was that, you know, we were at CBS on Beverly Boulevard and they were shooting a lot of things at CBS. They were shooting, um, you know, like some different news programs. They were shooting The Price is Right. They were shooting, um, God, was it The Young and the Restless? Was it Young and Restless? I think it was The Young and the Restless. My boyfriend's mother was on that. And uh, and then they had this cafeteria. So you'd be walking or like you'd go in, you'd get in your hair and your makeup. And then there was a lot of makeup. And then you'd put on your robe, you'd have your rollers in, and you'd have your tissues, you know, shoved in your robe so that your makeup doesn't get everywhere and you're just walking around the hallway and you know there's Bob Barker and there's Carol Burnett and you know there's your boyfriend's mom (laughs) you know like everybody's just like going to the office right um it was a great time it was a really great time but you know growing up watching The Price is Right um there was something magical about going to work and, you know, shooting this soap opera and hearing that, that Price is Right music in the hallway, you know, that do, do, to do, right. do, 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 and just, you know, I felt like I made it. <laughs> I bet you did. I bet There's you little did. things that make you feel like you made Absolutely. it. And that was one of those sweet little moments that, you know, I'll take to the grave that, Good feeling hearing that music in the hallway. You know, talking a little bit more about the modeling, you had, you know, several national modeling campaigns for you, including L'Oreal Paris, uh, Haynes, Maui Gym Sunglasses, Sky Vodka, several more. And you started in television commercials for Toyota, Coors, you know, Visa, Budweiser, Chrysler. What did you enjoy most about doing that, representing, you know, major national brands? You know, um, I loved, you know, commercials were literally commercials in print where they were like my bread and butter. Um, When you're a working actor, you are, it's like the cycle of your trying to get a pilot. You hope that pilot goes to series. You've got your episodes, you, you know, your episodic TV. Then you've got your commercials running and you, you know, you can have like a beer or a credit card, you know, all these different things um so it was it was like uh it was like a machine and um yeah so I just loved I've always loved that process of showing up going all in for something you know when you're on the set you're in your own little world you're in your own little universe there and you show up and you are that, like if you are playing a rollerblader, you know, in a Chrysler commercial, you show up and you know that you, you your whole life is about rollerblading. Like you have to embody that and you live that and like jumping into that life and being 100% focused on that for that day, day and a half, whatever it was, and then leaving, you know, it's like this all or nothing show mentality um that's always felt really good to me um you know i'm not my brain isn't creatively like i'm not good with um balancing being creative with you know and now i'm gonna stop every hour and a half and you know, get to my phone calls or type on the computer. Like it doesn't work that way for me. Like if I have those starts and stops, I just, I can't dive into that creative space. I need, I need that protected area to really jump in. So um, it's a beautiful time. It was a beautiful space, you know, to really be 100% focused creatively. I bet that had to be just a lot of fun for you. Oh, it was fantastic. Yeah. I love my job. When you first moved to LA, you went to a commercial acting class. Um, You walked in, 
your hair all curled in a pink bow. From what I understand, you look just like a beauty queen. You met another young actor there and told her that you needed an apartment. Very uh-huh. next day, you went to her apartment. You guys became roomies. Mm-hmm. Now, she, now, she told me that she was not the decorator at all and asked you, you asked her if you could decorate, you know, the place and you made it beautiful. <laughs> she said you painted it. You know, some talents I believe you probably got from your mom. Um, <laughs> I'm speaking, of course, as you know, your longtime friend, Julie Simone. You um, spoke with Julie? I, I, sp- I spoke with Julie over the computer, yes. Oh, my God. Uh, I love Julie. She's the she best. said of you, quote, Kathleen is one of my most fun, creative, and generous friends. She shows up, shows up with enthusiasm and can do spirit to everything from a girl's night out, reading a friend's rewritten script, or pitching to help with an event to aid battered women. A true renaissance woman who can do it all, unquote. No. That's awesome. You know, tell no. us about the Julie that you know and the bond that you guys have shared for so many years. You know, it's I can't, I can't say enough good things about her. She's one of the most amazing, resilient, creative human beings I've ever met. Um, and the apartment that she's referring to, we called it the 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 Barbie Dream Cottage. Because <laughs> <laughs> of the of the pink decor that we had. Um, so crazy to think about all the fun stories and people and situations that were in and out of in and out of that apartment with all of our acting and rehearsing and insanity um yeah just sorry a funny story i digress <laughs> there was a an actor who um you know we i was in the howard fine acting studio and you know he's a really big guy he was a big football player and we were rehearsing a, a very violent. She told me the story. Tell, go ahead and tell it. It's great. <laughs> it's so he was, we were, um, you know, he came over and we were rehearsing and there was a lot of little old ladies in that apartment building. And I guess they were really scared and ready to call the police because they said this large man is threatening <laughs> Kathleen and it just, it sounds awful. And I guess they all had their ears pressed to the door and they realized that we were having the same argument or fight over and over and over again. They said, oh, they're, just, they're just rehearsing a scene. You know, that's LA. You always have to wonder if something's really happening or if somebody's, somebody's just rehearsing. Um, but yeah, I mean, Julie, oh God, she, she's so creative. She's so imaginative. She's so amazing. And you know, I mean, in life, I I think we've both um, we both endured some similar um, obstacles or uphill roads, I'll call them, and um, and you know, here she is at a place where in life where you know her kids are off in college, and um, things have really settled down in her life, and she was finally able to focus on her creativity with no distractions whatsoever. And she went and took a camera and took her sister and went to a fiddle playing contest in West Virginia and shot an unbelievable documentary that she then edited. And um, it won so many amazing awards and it is just, it has changed her life and she, um, you know, like she's a grown up. We're not 20. Right. And she she did it. And the the stuff that she's working on now and pitching now is groundbreaking. Awesome. And the stuff that she has learned, the life lessons that she has learned, the the hardships that she has navigated, um, you know, like you can go through some tough stuff in life and you just hope that it's money in the bank, that you're going to be able to absorb that and you're going to learn a lesson and you're going to regurgitate it out in the form of something creative that helps other people, that makes somebody else feel better about where they're at, that shines a light on circumstances in a different way than we've seen them. And that's exactly what she's doing. Um, And I couldn't be more proud of her and excited for her or grateful for um, 
her encouragement and her always believing in me. And, you know, just the fact that when she does these, these um, rewrites of her script that she actually asked me for my opinion, like it just makes me feel great. So yeah. Love Julie. And don't even remember what the original question was. You you answered it. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I saw a great quote from Quincy Jones about Fiddlin. And he was Mm -hmm. telling people that they had to go see it. It's, it's unbelievable. It's such a fantastic, amazing documentary. I, I can't, I can't say enough good things about it. Yeah. I can't wait to watch it. Yeah. No. Yeah. Run, don't walk. Yes, absolutely. Okay. You know, Kathleen, the nineties were a really busy time for you. You were in so many you know, huge hit television shows. One of my favorite all time shows, Married with Children. Uh, in Living Color, The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Herman's Head, Murphy Brown, Suddenly Susan, and several more. Now, what was it like to be around and work with, you know, these big TV stars only in your 20s at the time? And, you know, what did you learn about yourself, you know, doing those shows? Um, You know, I mean, it's kind of like back to what I was saying before. Like, if you don't think, if you just are living in the moment and you're like, this is where life has taken me. It's just where I was. It's it's where we were working. And I mean, the pool of creative, amazing people, you know, interesting people grew on trees and it was such an exciting time. Um, like, for example, like my first my first series that I did, um, it was called Hotel Dicks. So I had done a pilot and we were picked up. So we, we went to, um, we became an episodic show. Of course that show never aired, but it was called Hotel Dicks and it was starring myself, Morris Day and Jerome. And I don't know if you know. I love them. I love the time. They're they're the best. Now, like looking back, like it's so creative what we, what we all lived through because nobody loved Prince more than me. Nobody. Um, and you know, there I am, like, I think two years out of high school and I'm starring in a show with Morris and Jerome and they were even on the phone with Prince And, and it didn't even, it didn't even dawn on me the irony or how cool that was. Like, it was just life. It was just life. Like interesting people grew on trees. Such good music too. They were such oh. a fun, yeah, fun band. Yeah, they're they're fantastic, fantastic, great times. Um, but yeah, I mean, like every day, every day was like play. Every day was like going to the sandbox. Um, you know, every day was an adventure. Every day was like playing the lottery, and you know, if you like. If you had a meeting, you had a meeting with somebody interesting, whether you got the job or not really didn't matter because you were in the room with somebody who was fascinating, inspiring, exciting, and um, just the rich experience of life, you know, in that time, you know, having the time to just drive from meeting to meeting to meeting and meet with these people. And, you know, it was just such a fertile ground for ideas and inspiration and um you know it's exciting i bet that was quote my first car is still my favorite car 1975 cadillac eldorado convertible if you're ever feeling down take it for a spin people walk right up to you move by your memories it stirs in their heart they tell you beautiful stories of the past full of delicious details, unquote. I love that. You know, mm-hmm. tell us what I can only guess was probably just a beautiful car and a few of those memories that you have from it. Well, yeah, my first car was, it was actually a 1976. Okay. Cadillac. That one was a 76. It was white with tan interior. Um, trying to remember what the nickname was for that car. I don't remember. We all had nicknames for our cars, but I mean, it was, it was the greatest. I loved that car. I never felt as fancy in a car as I did in that car. Um, I think that car actually passed away in a high school parade. Um, Nick Sidoni, my backdoor neighbor was 
driving it. And I think he was wearing like a catcher's mask and a clown wig. And I think he was hit in the face with a water balloon by the football players in front of us. And I think we may have hit that car and that car hit another car. I don't know. Anyway, we said goodbye to that car after that parade incident. Um, but in my heart, that was always the greatest car of all times. And um, I think it was about 10 years ago, I got that car again. I got that. This time it's a 1975 and it's um, it's black with white interior. But man, I mean, when I drive that car now, it's just, I mean, people will literally follow you and pull you over and tell you a story um, with tears in their eyes. It's, uh, I mean, that literally happened like a month ago, I went and met a friend for dinner and I never exactly have too much faith in the headlights of that car. So it was a big, you know, I stayed out, stayed out past dark and uh, was driving back on the freeway in the car and and uh, somebody was following me and they got off at my exit. And I thought, well, this is funny. And they they came up next to me and I thought, oh God, what is this person doing? You know, like they're not going to follow me home. I'm going to stop. And then and they wanted to tell me a story. Nice. About their vintage car. Yeah. Yeah. I actually um, want to do a spill the beans with some of my ideas, but it's a dream of mine to do a coffee table book and just literally take that car and go from uh, one location to another and spend eight hours doing it and just see, see what people tell you. Make I it like that. Look. Yeah. That's neat. Yeah. You definitely need to do that for sure. Yeah. I actually started long story started on the process and um, talked to a, a producer, art director, friend um who you know trying to do me a favor devil's advocate gave me all the reasons why it wasn't going to work why it was going to cost too much money why it was going to why it was just a disaster waiting to happen and it was you know it wasn't going to pan out and uh and uh it's funny i just ran into him the other night and i had to thank him for um discouraging me because <laughs> He discouraged me about a 24 hour project about a book. And somehow I pivoted into a much <laughs> larger, unbelievably time consuming project, which I won't exactly go into right now. I'm, I'm in the middle of it. Um, and I want to get further along before I start talking about it. But, um, but you know, it's a passion project. And uh, I said, thank you. I think. You know, because I, because of not doing this little tiny itty bitty project, I'm doing this huge project. But right. you know, again, following your passion, yeah, following your gut instinct takes you to interesting places. And I am, I'm definitely on a path right now with that project. You know, I have so much more that I want to talk to you about, including, of course, good naked, bad naked. Uh, I'd love to have you back on for part two. So not only we can talk about that. You know, talk about your brand, uh, Rich Life Made Simple. And, you know, I can't wait, you know, for you to share with the audience, you know, also about the new podcast that you're launching too. Does that sound good? I would love that, Michael. Thank you so much for having me on. And thank you for doing so much research. You've really made it fun. Oh, it's been my pleasure. You know, I'd also like to um, thank uh, my new sponsor for the show, which is Platinum Jewelers. I appreciate that. And uh, this has been a lot of fun today. And I can't wait to have you back on again soon, Kathleen. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Michael. And thank you for all of your encouragement and, um, you know, encouragement with getting the podcast going. I truly believe that, you know, there's so much, there's, there's more than enough to go around. And that when we meet other fellow creative people, never to look at it as anything but exciting and right. working together and encouraging each other, because I feel like more begets more begets more begets more. I've never um, had an experience where working with somebody and collaborating, um, you know, created some sort of a competition. Like it always made more and it's, uh, and not everybody thinks that way. And I just right. if so enjoyed getting to know you since you initially called me about being 
on your show. And, um, and I just love working with you and collaborating with you and really excited about my podcast journey and continuing our podcast journey friendship together. So absolutely. It's been my pleasure. I've had a lot of fun too. So I appreciate it. Yeah. We will see you soon. You soon, Michael. Thanks. Bye-bye.